Hello, everyone. I am joined today by MMA Junkies, Nolan King. Nolan, how we doing? I'm doing well, man. I appreciate the uh, you having me on to chat. I know we've been trying to do this for a little while, and uh, we finally uh, found a time that works for both of us. And here we are, man. I'm I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I know you had uh, you went on one, uh, you had went on a vacation to see one of your friends in Colorado. Tell me about that vacation. How was it? Had would you? Yeah, go? it was. It was good, man. Yeah, yeah. One of my best friends from high school and through college, and uh, he's out in Colorado doing kind of a long-term Airbnb thing with his girlfriend. So uh, I went out there and, and visited them for a weekend. It was fun. Um, it was it was like one of those, you know, when traveling around, like there's certain conversations you have that you just kind of like, oh, you, you, I get in the Uber, right? Okay. And the guy's like, hey. Uh, the uber driver is like hey oh you picked like the you know the four days that it's gonna rain this year to be here so like that's that's happened to me before i was in arizona in december uh and it was like the two weeks that it rained there was when i was there so uh it's just my luck but we had fun anyway we made the most of it and i uh, got to have some you know go get some eat some good food and, and have some drinks and just you know see my friends it was it was great man i had a good time awesome i'm glad to hear you had a good time it's uh yeah. it seems like it like you know it was like it's like an eloping kind of experience like you just go out there for like a couple of weeks and just do like anything you want it's kind of funny so yeah you, yeah that's cool you had went to college for biomedical sciences and you were an emt for a bit but you were part-time kind of working mma mm -hmm. how did you get full-time and how did just how did you transition into journalism you've done your research that's impressive that you know that uh yeah, man, it was it was interesting, right? Because I joined, I jumped into college um, at the University of New Hampshire in 2014, or 20, yeah, 2013, 2014. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was undeclared. And uh, I also was kind of going in on a part time basis. I had had a bad concussion my senior year of high school. Okay. So um, my feeling I went on undeclared and my feeling out process of like trying to figure out what I wanted to do, I, I had to figure it out through the third semester that I was there. So I was kind of at a disadvantage in that I only took like, you know, the first year, I think I took like half, half workloads or 75% workload. So I didn't get to explore as much as maybe some other people do when they're, they're going, when they're trying to figure out what they wanted to yeah. do. So it kind of got down to crunch time. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to try like biomed. I know it's hard. It's going to be a lot of work, but I think I have a good work ethic. And I, I kind of like science, even though it maybe wasn't my best subject. Like I always kind of was like, it was enjoyable enough for me. Okay. Whereas like I was good at math and I was good at history, but I didn't really like them. It was kind of, you know, not my thing. So went down that road. Um, and then ultimately kind of towards the end of, uh, my college tenure, I, you know, I was working as an EMT to build hours to go to, uh, grad school. Yeah. Um, you needed a certain amount to become a PA, like a hands-on experience with patients. So mm -hmm. I was, uh, working up in Durham, New Hampshire as an EMT okay. And so it got down to kind of like my, it was, I think it was like maybe two weeks before I graduated and um, I'd been working on the side just for fun. I had created a Twitter account one day. I was doing kind of like big Marcel does now where yeah. you kind of have the split image, like photos of just all the fight announcements and where they were announced and crediting people and whatever. And just kind of tried to be a feed where everybody could go and see all the fights that have popped up on different media things. So okay. I did that on the side. Um, kind of started writing for a website called MMA Today for free. I didn't get paid anything. It was just kind of like an experience builder. They had, you know, Bellator credentials and World Series of Fighting credentials, and I could get into all the smaller shows. So um, kind of just did that, figured it would be a hobby. And then uh, maybe in 2018, at the beginning, or late 2017, um, Flow Combat, which at the time was a little bit, you know, more of a thing than it is now. I think it still exists, but had a few writers. They were like, hey, do you want to do, you know, eight articles a month for us and, and we'll pay you, you know, whatever X amount. And it was like, man, now I can make a little bit of money doing this. Yeah. And I got on board with Topology who was paid, you know, paid me pretty well, I think for what I was doing. And I'm, I'm still with them. Nice. Um, and then probably 2018, right before graduation, like I was saying a couple weeks before um, there was, it was around the time that Ariel was leaving to go to ESPN and okay. um, it kind of shook up the industry a little bit. And I, would uh, you know, there were some feelers that were put out from some companies that were like, Hey, would you be interested in a full-time position? Like, is this just something you're trying to do? Okay. And I was like, you know, honestly, I never really thought it would be an option, but like, if you guys are, are interested, like I'll certainly talk. Yeah, so I'll take the chance. I, I, I got, can get it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, well, if this is actually an option, like I would have to consider it. Um, so I, I talked to them. They were like, okay, well, you know, I'm, I'm you know throwing your name in the hat and see if there's uh, you know, if our managing editors want to interview you. 
And so I never, I never heard back. Uh, you know, it just, it wasn't, it kept getting pushed like, Oh, like, you know, you might reach out. You might reach out. I never got like a no. Yeah. So I was kind of like, shit, like now I'm graduated. I don't really know what to do. It's doing the EMT thing still to, to build some experience, but you got to get a lot of hours. So I was essentially doing the freelance stuff, you know, the three websites, MMA Today, Glow Combat, and then Tapology. And then I would do overnights as an EMT in New Hampshire. And I would also work at my uncle uh, has a, a company here in Massachusetts that does kitchen equipment. So I would do like two days a week or three days a week with him at the desk, two overnights as the EMT, and then the MMA stuff on the side. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of my, that was up until the point that I ended up, uh, finally having some brands loop back around to me about a year later, um, in 2019. And that's when I ultimately made my, that was around the time that the athletic got involved in MMA. So that was when everybody looped back to me and, uh, I made my decision to join junkie. Okay. So basically you, uh, you were, you were mixing in everything else, but the MMA thing was the one thing that stayed consistent throughout. It's the one thing that you were doing. Like it, it was on the side, but at the same time, yeah. it's the thing you did more consistently than your other jobs. Cause like you said, it was only like two days a week here, two days a week here. But then the MMA is just, you can't really take like, you know, like five days off a week because there's, you know, you never know what happens on what day. You just, you can't totally. take those kind of breaks. So yeah, no, I think it's cool. You mentioned that concussion before I wanted to ask, was that while playing basketball? I think you would play, you played basketball when you were. Yeah. In, yeah. Yep. Okay. That was, uh, that was during basketball. So my senior year, I, I took a dive on the ground to, uh, to save a loose ball, kind of whack my head off the ground. And like, when I got up, like I was seeing stuff on my vision and whatnot. And so at the time, it was probably right around the time that like they started kind of you started hearing like concussion awareness stuff and like we would get like, you know, pamphlets and stuff. But I went and got checked out by the doctor and they were like, oh, like, we think you're good. Like, don't worry about it. And it just like I think that it was right before the season started. So we were doing like really hard workouts and trials and stuff. So I think like just, you know, that period of time where they're like, oh, you should chill for a couple of weeks and not really. I think it was just like the most that I exerted myself of, you know, the calendar year. So uh, I I woke up one day and I was just like, man, I can't do this. I'm exhausted all the time, like watching TV. So it took me like months to kind of readjust with like post-concussion syndrome and stuff. But eventually it's funny, man, the brain, like they don't know much about concussions, but eventually it seemed like I turned a corner. Um, Maybe when I went to college, uh, you know, the first couple of months there and um, no, no issues anymore. That's good to hear. It's good to hear at least that uh, that corner was able to turn and that you were, your brain was able to like, heal up properly because concussions can definitely be scary. And, you know, obviously sure. you were kind of missed. And now I cover MMA. Yeah. Yeah. And now you cover yeah. and now you cover a sport where they're given out on a nightly basis. <laughs> yeah. So we're uh, all we're all part of the circus here, yeah, man. We, you know? not, we all are. I agree. Yeah. So you talked about how it was when you first got into MMA and how all your favorites were the New England guys. But who are some of your favorites now that you've you're more of a developed journalist and that you have like, you know, that repertoire with some guys? Yeah, no, I mean, it's uh, it's interesting, like I, in, from a historical kind of context, you know, that was always the guys I would root for pretty hard were local guys that I could kind of relate to. Um, excuse me, but. I think looking back on it, one of the coolest figures that I really like now is Kimbo Slice. Um, okay. I think he played sneaky, like a big, he had like a very sneaky um, impact on my fandom, I think, which was like, he got me to consistently watch it as I was falling in love with it. It would it would remind me, you know, I was watching him fight after, uh, you know, Seth Petrozelli, which obviously didn't go his way, but also, um, you know, the UFC, the tough stuff, the UFC stuff. So I think looking back on it, like he was one of the coolest figures, you know, and it was just, he's, he's a different guy. There's only going to be one of them. He was an icon. Sure. Like he wasn't the best MMA fighter, whatever. (laughs) But um, I think I've grown an appreciation for guys like him, guys like Anderson Silva, who just had a certain allure about him that was very rare. And I still don't think could be replicated. So um, there's something to be said about the legends that have kind of flipped the switch in my brain where I, I come out with like a tremendous amount of respect, just realizing not only what they did inside the cage, but also what they were able to generate outside of it for the sport. So those are kind of two guys that, that come to mind when you ask that question. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I kind of agree. I kind of have to agree because I'm five months into the whole journalism thing. And if you had asked me when I first started, I probably would have said that Khabib is better than Aldo all time. Now, if you ask me, it's not even close. It's not like Aldo, totally. Aldo is clearly a better all time fighter. Khabib might have been more dominant when he fought and in those fights, but Aldo's career still is like so miles ahead of his. So, yeah, you know, it kind of makes, it's, it's, it makes it's, you realize it's interesting legends. you bring that up. Mm-hmm. Totally. And I was saying to somebody the other day, it's like my biggest struggle is coming in as a hardcore fan in 2010. Um, you know, after the UFC had already had 100 plus pay per views and a bunch of fight nights, was like, 
not necessarily trying to learn the history of the sport because I think it's easy to look at a championship lineage and be like, oh, you know, Pat Militich did this and, uh, you know, so-and-so did that. But I think the hardest thing is understanding what it was le- like to live through it in the yeah. moment, the buildups, the anticipation, who the public really thought was going to win this no, one I or how it was going to go, you know, and where the world stood at that time. So that's been a tough thing for me to figure out. But once you're able to, you know, watch maybe a little bit more and read about it a little bit more than just seeing results, I think you start to kind of grow that appreciation. Especially with the betting odds too. Like the betting odds aren't a thing until recently. So you can't even, yeah. you, you can't even really say like, look back and kind of be like, okay, so this guy was a heavy favorite and this guy was a slight underdog. Like that really wasn't a, a thing back then. So you can't even get that vibe from it either. And you really don't, just you can't get those fight week vibes like going into those major fights like Adesanya Pereira, Adesanya Pereira mm. too. Like those were some massive fights, fight week vibes, and like you, you just can't replicate those kind of things. I get exactly where you're coming from there. Yeah, totally. I mean, Connor's obviously the big one too. Like people can kind of understand now that he's a superstar and people are interested, but like that build he had through the you know through the uh, the ranks and all the discussion and debate and, you know, oh, he hasn't fought a wrestler and all this stuff. And then the way the Aldo thing ended and becoming the double, like that whole thing too. Like, sure, people can look at that now and say that was great. But I think if you didn't live in that moment where there was a lot of questions and a lot of uh, anticipation and cancellations that made you want, you know, oh, I'm going to see this thing. I'm going to see this Aldo fight. Oh, now I'm going to have to wait six more months. Like there's just so many emotions and storylines that come even before these guys step in the cage that even if you watch the third if you watch the 13 second aldo fight you're not going to understand it you know no 100 percent. you'll never never understand that and that's something i i won't ever understand i wasn't a fan at the time of mcgregor aldo and i will never understand anything past the the 13 second knock (laughs) but you're here now but but i do know how great aldo is like i said before so i who are some of your what were what have been some of your favorite interviews and who are some of the fighters that you find yourself like enjoying t- wanting to interview again and again and again some guys you might be close with whatever it is mm. yeah my favorite interviews um there's been some some ones that i've thought have been pretty decent um off the top of my head uh there was a story i came out with last year about brennan ward where he announced his comeback and about you know kind of revealed this like whole drug addiction he did that that, that he that he had to battle through yeah. um that was very impactful for me i spent a lot of time on it too like you know i think in this uh kind of run and gun era of MMA content and a million events and now PFL and Bellator and UFC. It's sometimes hard for us to kind of take our time with things, but um, and put, put a lot of work into something. So that was the first kind of experience I had had like that. And I felt like when it came out, the way it was received and um, you know, just kind of the way that he received it as well was, was pretty um, was cool for me because when I was growing up, yeah, it was very rewarding, you know, And, and I get it. Like, I think everybody in this industry will tell you, you know, there's certain things that like the public's very interested in something, even if it's, uh, you know, Jake Paul versus whoever, like there's a certain thing that we have to cover it. Yeah. Um, on the other side, you know, I wish there was more time for us to do those sort of longer projects. Yeah. I did one with Ed Herman recently um, before his retirement fight, just about kind of him being maybe uh, just kind of an anomaly of the guy that's been in the UFC the longest, but was never a contender and was thought of as kind of a jerk at the beginning of his life, but now people love him. So stuff like that has been my favorite stuff. I can spend time with um, Yancey Madera. So I went out and spent a day with him in Hawaii, mm-hmm. like in his hometown, you know, stuff like that. Those are the sort of things I, I really have liked. And then in terms of who I interview that I enjoy, um, obviously there's, there's some like that just have that allure that like that, that aura, I should say um, about them. Uh, Fedor, you know, guys like that. Um, just most of the guys I view as just people, but then there's that level of people that you're like, oh, this is Fedor standing yeah. in front of me. Like, he's looking at me. Um, You've talked to Fedor to a couple day. times, right? Yeah, I've interviewed yeah. Fedor. Uh, I've probably done like three one on ones with him mm-hmm. and then just like a handful of press conferences as well. So uh, that was, those are neat. But then also, my favorite are the guys that I've interviewed like before they were in the UFC. Like, I do an on the doorstep series where I pick five fighters every month that I, I think will win. I love that series. I love that series. It, I think it just, me too. And I appreciate you saying that. I think, again, when I look at my work, that's something that I really do enjoy because it's, I think it works out well for everyone, no, right? Like, I think fans, there's too many, there's a ton of MMA fighters. So, for fans to be able to kind of look at like five to watch is good for the reader. I think uh, for the fighters, it's like the first time they've been spotlighted on a big website. Yeah. And then like for me, it's obviously kind of it's very rewarding and kind of cool to like see where these guys, you know, kind of uh, end up. Right. Like those those are the guys I like talking to. It's kind of cool to like I interviewed somebody six years ago and now they're you ranked want, in the yeah, UFC. You kind of like, watch their journey as they progress. Yeah. 
yeah, it's very interesting. It's it's fascinating. And sure, sometimes the guys, you know, have uh, rougher goes than others. But um, regardless, I think a lot of those guys end up where, you know, the theme of the story is the UFC. Most of them do end up there. So it's cool, man. I enjoy it a lot. That's awesome. All right. So yeah. who uh, – oh, wait, you talked about that Yancey Madero stock that you did down in Hawaii. Just tell me a little bit more about that. Where did you get the idea from that? Have you ever done something like that? And do you plan on doing something like that again? Yeah, I would definitely do something like that again. For that one, um, we had gone out to – it was me and Matt Erickson, who's a longtime MMA junkie editor, who uh, kind of is the behind-the-scenes guy. He's the one that kind of keeps everything rolling, maybe doesn't necessarily put his face out there very often. Um, but he's been on staff, I believe. Uh, besides the radio guys, he's the longest tenured staff member. Okay. Um, but he's great. He's been a great role model for me. Um, he comes from a newspaper background. But anyways, me and him were doing uh, Bellator in San Jose the same week that um, Cain Velasquez was getting uh, having one of his first hearings out there for his arrest. So we ended up going out there for, uh, you know, I forget how long we were there for. Um, we were there probably for, you know, three days doing that. And then it went right into Bellator fight week. They happened to be there as well. And then Hawaii was the next week. And so rather than have us fly, you know, he's from Chicago. So for, to have him go from Chicago to San Jose, back to Chicago, and then to Hawaii, and me do the same thing to and from Boston, um, you know, USA Today sent us. We're just like, you can just, it's like, you know, a cheap flight. We'll put the, you know, the extra couple nights in the hotel just because it would save us money versus, nice. you know, four flights. So we did that and we just had a few days to kill. You know, there was a few days we had our weekend where it was our days off, but then we had a couple of days before the Bellator festivities began. So we were trying to figure out a way that like what to do. You know, we could work it. Right. We could work a desk yeah. shift in our hotel. Like yeah, we were do from, something. <laughs> but but for us, it was like, what can we do while we're here? So, um, you know, I think was kind of the one that came to mind just because I think he was maybe a little bit of a different story, like a guy that, you know, had been left the UFC as, as a pretty exciting fighter that had kind of had to advocate and pitch online and do this, you know, whole thing to try to get to Bellator. And then they sign him for this event, but he's on a one fight deal, even though he's kind of a name. So I figured, all right, like, let me try to, to hit him up. And sure enough, like, you know, he couldn't have been nicer. I, I honestly, I don't know if I'd ever even talked to him before that. Okay. Like I went through um, his management through uh, at the time was Iridium Sports Agency and, and Ed Cap, who's I think the best PR guy in MMA. Man, I need, um, I need to get hooked up with that man. <laughs> he's the man. Yeah, he's great. I've you heard. know, it's it's one of those things like people don't understand uh, that haven't been on our side of the aisle how easy he makes it. Um, which just having giving. I mean, Ariel said this. I think the same thing on his show, but it was so true. It's like he tells me why I should interview somebody. Right? He sends me a pitch, and it's yep, like I saw thought the, out. I saw the this is that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, that's, he's always great. And like, even with this, it was super easy. He connected us. Nice. Um, and the next day we drove, Yancey was on the other side of the Island. So me and Matt, you know, took a rental car, we drove down there and we weren't really sure what we were going to do. We thought we were just going to interview him at the gym kind of on location and get his story. But he was like, I want to take you, like, I want to take you to the beach where I grew up. He's like, I want to, you know, show you my dog nice. and I want to go to this. Like he doesn't experience even experience. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he doesn't even, it's, he's cutting weight. He can't eat. He's a, <laughs> uh, he's a pr uh, plant-based, uh, he's got a plant-based diet, okay. so he doesn't even eat meat, but he took us to his favorite pokey shop from back when he used to eat seafood, That's you know? Awesome. And he sat there and couldn't eat and probably was starving to death, but it was cool, man. He couldn't have been more hosp hospitable. And so I, I kind of wanted to spend time with that. I think it energized both me and Matt to do a good, you know, kind of, again, take, take some, take some, some time, time away, yeah. you know, um, and, and do that. So, uh, yeah, it was great. It was a great experience and it was something I really, I would, I would definitely do it again, you know, if the opportunity arose. That's awesome. That's awesome. I definitely would love to see something like that again. I really enjoyed the Yancey doc. So I wanted you to break down the process of breaking a fight just from like, you know, not, you don't have to name sources, none of that, obviously. I'm just saying like how, getting the source, you know, making sure it's reliable, asking mm. the other party, just like break, break down everything for me. Yeah. So I would say usually, uh, you know, what we always, not usually the baseline for what we shoot for is to, to have two sources on something. So with fights, it's very, pretty, you know, easy because there's two parties that are involved. Um, but sometimes there can be, you know, other people that come at you from different angles that maybe aren't directly involved with either party, but they tell you how they know this or whatever, and it works out well. So um, that's usually our kind of our process is to try to have two, two sources on, um, you know, breaking news and exclusives and whatnot. I think obviously uh, having a staff of, 
multiple people that are really talented and kind of on the beat. We have Mike Baum, we have Farah Hanoon who also kind of assists me. So even if I don't necessarily, you know, if I hear of a fight and I have a source on it to try to get that second source, if I was on my own, it might be impossible uh, or just unlikely, so to speak, where now it's very easy because we're all so connected mm-hmm. in the industry and there's probably somebody that we can go to no matter who the fighter is That's and, really and at least cool. That's give really it an attempt. Cool. Yeah, it, it's been neat. It was, it was, it was good because I think to try to do it on my own gave me a good perspective of how hard it can be. But then like being with junkie now, it's been a lot easier and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely almost an unfair advantage at times, <laughs> but you know, it is what it is. And I think we have a pretty good track record. You guys, of, you guys of built sure that, It's up. definitely like, you know, it's deserved. You guys built that yeah, unfair yeah, yeah. advantage in a sense, because you guys For are, sure. you guys are one of the, you guys are probably the best out there, like the best out with. Well, so thank you. Of Appreciate course, that. It's awesome. So I wanted to ask, what has been your favorite event and what has been your favorite place to travel to? If well, I'm not – the I, second question is easy would be Hawaii. Okay. Uh, you know, I just think th- – there's there's some, been some other cool ones. I mean, Hawaii is just uh, – most of the senior people kind of do, like, the international stuff. Like, the people more senior than me. Like, when John Morgan worked for us, he did a lot of the, the – like, when they would go to Australia or Singapore or whatever. And now Mike Bond seems to, you know – I think – We've done Abu Dhabi in Singapore since John left um, international. Uh, we have uh, we have somebody in the UK, so he does all those events. But in terms of like kind of the off the grid, cool, like international places, those are Mike Bond's been covering those. So for me to do Hawaii was kind of the closest thing to that that I could get. Um, but in terms of there's other places that you come across, man, that like I think the fact that you kind of me don't get to pick the locations, um, you know, the UFC is just going to place X and somebody has to go there. Sometimes it can be rough but other times it can be pretty cool and like kansas city in april i think like all the media there kind of went in not necessarily thinking it would be the place to be but we had a good time you know yeah, we had no, a lot I saw of fun you posted. And, it was a really nice event yeah it was it was like a perfect place to be for like a, you know while you were working but then yeah. there was something to do there as well so um and then in terms of events uh that's a tough one man i think um doing the madison square garden show uh in november the ufc um 281 one. Um, yeah, that was cool to just kind of see that sort of massive sort of stage, um, doing my first event in Boston in 2019 was cool. Just kind of a personal bucket list thing. And then the other one too, was UFC 248 right before the pandemic. Um, you know, right before the world closed, man, uh, seeing, uh, Zhang Wei Li and Yolanda was, was very, very cool. That, that whole event had big feels. We had the whole junkie staff. They sent every single person that works to us. Uh, to Las Vegas for some meetings before the fight week began. So it was the first, it was just a cool experience. That's it was awesome. my first yeah. time getting on a plane for junkie. It was first time meeting all my coworkers and then that at the end. So those are just kind of some personal ones for me that I enjoyed. That's really awesome. That sounds like some great experiences you've had while in, uh, in your time here. So what is your opinion on other promotions like the PFL trying to buy Bellator and trying to compete with the UFC. I just like, no, I obviously like, do you think it's good for the sport that there's like the competition coming on or do you like the UFC? Um, it's, it's always tough, man, because I do like that there's competition. I think that it helps build like the fighters get paid better and it keeps everybody a little bit honest, you know, when somebody's a hot free agent or, or is, uh, you know, kind of coming to the, the end of their contract, I think, it's there's all if the UFC didn't have any competition, it would be uh, a little bit more problematic for the fighters. I think it would be less good for the industry. Um, and I like that people take different approaches. Like the UFC is a, I don't think anybody would argue that in terms of the product that they put out, it's not spectacular. I mean, it's fantastic. Um, some of the events that they put on the pay-per-views in particular, it's like, man, this is like a whole league above anything else that anybody could ever do. It's, it's awesome. So um, I'm definitely not somebody that's uh, does not appreciate that. But at the same time, I do appreciate the different approaches of like PFL trying a season is very cool. I think that, uh, you know, Bellator since in the last couple of years, even though maybe they don't have the name recognition of Chael Sonnens and whatnot, I do think they've done a really good job of signing really talented free agents and, and kind of taking a more merit based approach to the matchmaking and, and really trying to go off of what the rankings are. So, I'm very much a big fan of all of them. I understand the UFC kids grow up. They want to be a UFC <laughs> fighter. They don't necessarily want to be a Bellator fighter. Yeah, um, will that change saying, at some point? Yeah, I'm going to yeah, be in the PFL. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but that totally. could change. Totally. And, um, you know, in terms of the the, the, the merger, 
Um, that's an interesting one for me, man. Cause there's always like, I have, I have what I just told you on one shoulder, but then on the other shoulder I have, the, you know, whenever Patricio Pitbull, if he goes out and beats Sergio Pettis, uh, and next week I'll be like, man, like if he jumped into the UFC, that would be really freaking cool. Like seeing Michael Chandler go over there to just kind of see where they actually are against, you know, guys that we also know I've are very it. good is, yeah. is fascinating. And I, even like now, you know, with the Bellator thing, like in my head, it's been going, well, what if, uh, you know. Brendan Lockman fights Sergio Pettit, uh, fights uh, Patricio Pitbull, or you know, kind of matchmaking that Aljo way. Or Mix. To, yeah, like yeah. those, those would be that would be friggin' amazing. Amazing. But, um, so th- I see both sides of it. I guess as a fan, there's certain things that I could pull out of either way um, that I would enjoy, and then on the flip side, there would be certain things that I wouldn't love about it. So um, we'll see what happens. I, okay. I think Bellator sounds like we'll go some you know we'll have something happen with new ownership and, and being sold to some degree whether it's just a portion or the whole thing um doesn't necessarily sound like pfl but we'll see what happens man it's it's okay. interesting times the more the merrier you know yeah no it's awesome so you talked about how big of a year 2019 was for you because obviously it was that year right before covid you went you were work you were still working the three t- part-time jobs you had just joined mma junkie you had taken trips to the u.s across the u.s and to even ireland just talk to talk a little bit more about that year because i feel like it's real like it was a defining year in your career yeah um did you say the pandemic sorry right before the pandemic right before the pandemic yeah yeah that was that was um that was a big one man um it was definitely it went from like wanting this thing so bad to being uh you know, just being a reality. So it was, everything was new. Everything was fresh. Everything was, you know, my first experience doing X, Y, and Z. So just kind of having that fire lit under me was great and and trying to establish myself now that I had, you know, I had to work really hard to kind of establish myself as a rogue person. So now that I was there, I definitely wanted to keep that work ethic up and also see what kind of resources I could pull now that I had a team with me. Um, you know, trying to pull knowledge from people. I'd never had any sort of formal, uh, Hunter Homestick did do some workshops. I mean, he was great. He was probably one of my biggest mentors growing up, um, uh, excuse me, growing up in this industry, yeah. uh, who helped me a lot at my time at Flow Combat. We're still friends. He's a great guy doing some promoting now in, in Pennsylvania, but you know, he had run me through some workshops. So I had a little bit of knowledge, but then getting to to work with the likes of Matt Erickson and John Morgan and Simon Samano, guys that had been editors for, you know, 10 plus years. Um, some of them with formal newspaper experience. Simon used to work for the NF, uh, NFL.com, I believe. Oh, okay. um, you know, John's the ultimate road warrior of <laughs> MMA. <laughs> yeah, so he is. picking up a little bit of everything. People, some things there's no right or wrong answer. So you kind of got to make up your own style. But it was just kind of establishing um, the the way that I wanted to do things. I wasn't sure how I wanted to do things. And so that was a great experience being able to travel, being able to to connect with, you know, some of these people that I had looked up to in the industry for so long. Yeah. It really sounds like you were able to find like your way to do things in that year. And that it was like, you know, just kind of like, like, I think it was the biggest year defining of your career from what I, from what I was able to tell in my research. And from what I looked at, I think 2019 was a pretty big year for you. I feel like 100%. And I will say the pandemic for me too, is, was pretty big just in terms of now that sounds like horrible to say, but it's Bellator being dropped in my backyard in New England, I think too, was, it was a big thing. Okay. Um, you know, I did 20 plus weeks in 2020 in the bubble which turned into, you know, kind of a hell, but it was uh, after doing, you know, quarantining and all that stuff. But I think just being able to um, kind of get the reps in, I think that's such an important thing, you know, as as a new guy coming in, I wasn't necessarily getting a ton of on-site like coverage experiences. You know, I was, and rightfully so, I'm not, this is not a criticism. It just was, you know, I kind of had to make my way up the ladder, but, you know, prove to them that I could go to an event by myself, shoot video, you know, get it done. And we, we got a system down for me to be on, on site. So that was huge and good. built a lot of good connections and um, it gave me a different perspective on kind of how the, the fight world works. So nice. um, it was great, man. Yeah. Those, those, those two years have been the biggest, but nice. we'll see what's, we'll see what's around we'll the see, corner. Yeah, we'll see what's around the corner. There's still a lot, yeah. a lot of time left. I haven't peaked yet. <laughs> <laughs> so what are some fights that aren't made, aren't being talked about any of that, that you would like to see, in the next year, the next two years, like let's let's like I'm not talking about like a Leon Colby. I'm talking about something that yeah, yeah. something that you just want to see. Yeah, well, I mean the biggest one, and it's it's not being talked about. I'm sure a lot of people have, like 
have it in their brain is is the Izzy versus Pereira three rematch. I know Alex has gone up to 205, and it doesn't seem like the UFC has really showed any interest in making the trilogy. He has, you know, him and Izzy have gone back and forth and whatnot, but it's not like there's anything solid there that we can say, well, the UFC's building to this, and yeah, you know, no, Alex is going to move back down. If, if anything, like, Alex, Dana Alex was against it. If anything, Dana yes, was against yeah. it in the press conference after the fight. Which was, which was selfishly, you know, a pretty mega bummer because I, I love watching those two guys fight. I could watch them a thousand times. I think they're so exciting and just the rivalry, the whole thing just gets me. And I mean, leaving an unanswered trilogy in MMA is, is just brutal as well. But um, that that's one for sure that I'm very interested in. Um, in terms of other fights, uh, it's tough, man. I mean, there's, there's, I think bantamweight obviously is, is thriving. So there's a number of different fights there that you can make. I mean, Cheeto versus Jan seems like a good one. Um, I think that would be a really fun, and that's that's a good thing about I saw, MMA too. I saw is, something about Cheeto and Jan the other day. Was that true or was that a lie? Have you um, heard anything about I think that? I Cheeto had tweeted something about Jan being hurt, which is okay. something that I had also kind of heard behind the scenes. Um, but I haven't heard anything of it about it being proposed or worked on or anything. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's 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 so many different ones, man. Um, you know, John versus Sergey Pavlovich, I think would be kind of a hardcore fight that would be fun. I don't know. if John in his aspirations of fighting Stipe and, and uh, Tyson Fury necessarily uh, <laughs> wants to stick around for Sergey, but I think part of it's because Sergey's really good, man. No, you know, it's, yeah, it's the risk reward. And um, I wish I had better answers for you, but those no, are kind of the, okay. the ones that pop it's into okay. my it's, brain. It's a tough question. Yeah. Don't worry. Yeah. All right. So yeah. this is, you don't have to obviously, but is there any news breaks or rumors that you're hearing right now that you'd like mm. to, uh, like to talk about, like to just throw out there for the first time, just anything that you don't, you don't um, know. I wouldn't mind giving you something if I had it. Uh, well, recently there's been a big wave of female signings. Uh, that seems very intentional. Um, I think the UFC is really trying to build the 125 and 135 pound divisions. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it doesn't make sense. No, I mean they have to be because it doesn't make sense why they're signing all these like younger, fresh girls and then giving yeah. a guy like George Hardwick a DWCS fight. Right, totally. I think it's it's more like the division yeah, they're looking that's at. Exact, like, that's man, exactly need, what it is. We need contenders, mm-hmm. and um, I think they did something a little bit similar before contender last year, where they grabbed a couple of Invicta fighters, and it was again, it was like June or something of last year. They like signed Emily Decody and a bunch mm-hmm. of other people. That kind of comes to my brain. Um, in terms of other things, man, no, I, I put out a few news scoops yesterday. That was kind of what I had in my back pocket. Gotcha. Um, no, no, it's okay. sorry. Next time I come on, if I have something, I'll no, give it to you. No, but... dude, it's okay. I, I, it was, a, it was a shot in the dark. I just wanted to say, <laughs> no, I, I respect that. Cause here's the thing. I've been on the other side where it's like, uh, you know, we'll be trying to get something out of Dana or whatever, yeah, and he'll yeah. be sitting tight, but. I uh, no, no okay. I'd like to I'd like to break that cycle and throw some good karma into the universe, but I just don't have anything. <laughs> no, it's okay, man. All right, Nolan, I appreciate your time. I appreciate everything. This was an awesome interview, and I uh, I thank you seriously. It was great being able to talk to you. Yeah, likewise, man. We'll have to do it again sometime yeah, and no, keep definitely. doing your thing. I know you're on your build, and uh, it was great talking to you face. Well, I guess kind of face to face, right in through the uh, the computer. <laughs> and, yeah, in a sense, in 2023, face to face. So.